I think I hear an advocate for a different kind of global warming. <laughs> the melting of icebergs. We, your applause expressed your appreciation. My guess is uh, some of the appreciation is so deep within our thinking that it's going to take a while to absorb and come to an awareness of, of the full fullness of what we've heard. We now invite uh, our two respondents to come individually, and I think at least Will is going to come to the platform. Uh, Will Green will be responding for first, followed by Dean Leitze, and uh, each of them has been given a certain number of minutes. I won't tell you, but they know, <laughs> <laughs> and, and they know that uh, I will invite them to conclude at a certain point <laughs> by simply standing at my seat. And then after they have responded, I will invite uh, Bishop Talbert and the two respondents to have some conversation together if they wish, and then we will open it up for dialogue uh, for questions from any of you who wish to do that. You begin by saying when I read the invitation to participate, I was grateful to see that it said I was being asked to speak from the heart. And I thought, I'm a Methodist preacher, I can do that. Uh, so if this sounds more like a prepared sermon and less like my attempt to respond off the cough immediately, then you're welcome. <laughs> the, text for, the text for this sermon, which I have prayed about and studied, and which has disclosed to me a word from God, seated directly next to me and was standing at the podium a moment ago, Bishop Tepper. Before uh, saying how he has moved me, I want to start uh, by naming something about my life. I want to start by admitting that I have a problem. There are two parts of my identity that I have trouble reconciling. It's not being Christian and gay. Those things go together very well for me. Uh, but I am referring to my dual identity around the United Methodist Church. Here's where I'm going. I am someone who is committed to working on the technical problems of running the United Methodist Church, and I'm also a parish pastor. This is a conflict for me because being in ministry in our denomination, in a local church, and then denominational management can create tensions in my life. What do I even call this side of the equation? You might say, I'm a bureaucrat. <laughs> That's when I get elected and appointed to things, and when my agenda wins and votes, I'm a bureaucrat. But when it loses and I get kicked out, I become an activist. So whatever it is, it's being involved in the United Methodist Church, and also serving people in a local church. This can create tension that I bet some of the pastors in the room can identify with. On the structure side of things with the church, we work to craft language that will pass committee votes. But then on the service side of things, every day of our lives, we tell people not to be held back by that sort of stuff. And we preach that they should uh, instead learn to live with embodied integrity, no matter what the structure of the church says. On the structure side of things, we focus on votes at general conference. But on the service side of things, we focus on lives in our community. This goes back and forth. On this side of things, we protest things that must change. And then over here, we help people follow Christ wherever they are, here and now. This side tries to organize activists. Very difficult. And this side just shares the gospel and lets it go free. So my problem comes down to this. I'm trying to serve people in a church that has enough issues all on its own. <coughs> it's hard to help people find the God of their wholeness in a church that is broken. So at times I feel trapped by the reality of the limitations and the restrictions that are all around me in ministry. And also, I'm both a pastor and an activist involved in the church, and it's difficult for me. So plenty of people are much more trapped than I am, uh, people who are in the closet. Uh, people who are just trying to take much smaller steps than uh, reforming the book of discipline. You know, can I carry this sign in public? 
Can I wear a pin? Can I just tell the truth? This challenge is a reality. And I don't think that this challenge is going to go away in 2016 when we have our next general conference of the United Methodist Church. In fact, I think things will probably get worse and continue to become uh, more homophobic in our church structure. But this brings me to our guest of honor, Bishop Talbert. I give thanks to God for Bishop Talbert's words, in particular I'm thinking his words on the last day of general conference when he declared uh, to our church very clearly a, a statement that's been called either an altar for all, have you read it, have you seen it, or it's been called, uh, called biblical obedience, have you signed it, are you doing it? Uh, I've got some of your words here. On that day you very clearly said that derogatory, within the United Methodist Church, derogatory language and restrictive laws are immoral, unjust, and no longer deserve our loyalty and obedience. Don't you love it? Yeah. <laughs> By the way, if there's any middle school student in confirmation in your local church who isn't really clear that this is the only appropriate reaction to oppression already, then you want to help them with that and get to a better place. This is obvious for most of us. The bishop is simply and scandalously repeating our ancient instructions to proclaim the gospel. Our mandate to offer Christ and to be, as you have said, to be pastoral in the normal course of our pastoral ministry is a hope that's not based on our ability to solve all the technical problems of the United Methodist Church. Uh, and it's, it's not uh, focused on our ability to overcome all of the obvious issues that we face. But instead, the bishop is sharing a hope that connects us to God's faithfulness that is alive in us, despite the distracting challenges of reality. Now, let me tell you a story that some of you lived with me. This is a good memory I have from General Conference 2012. There are some good memories, <laughs> don't worry. This is a good one. It took place during the second day of our holy conferencing, our second holy conferencing session. Some of you remember, because you designed it, I think, um, that uh, we had a few different conversations around key issues in the church. First, we had a conversation around sexuality. We had some issues in that conversation. Bullying and other bad things happened. Also signs of life, but there were some bad things that happened. But this conversation was, I think it was called Regional Issues, if I've got it right, where we divided up according to a geographic uh, area on the globe. All the delegates from the United States of America were in the main convention center hall. And uh, they were about to have their uh, discussion about uh, issues for uh, people face, uh, that are being faced in the United States of America. Now picture this hall. I'm going to describe it for you. Not surprisingly, if you know I this church, it was just a horrible structure. It was like an airplane hangar. I mean, it was a really, really, really difficult space. It was huge. Thousand people seated here. And then way down far, if you look down that way, a long way away at the end of this cavernous rectangle, was the stage. And that's where the you know, microphones, the instruments, and all the cameras were focused way down there. That's where the podiums were, where the bishops sat, and where perhaps the power was. And stretching backwards from them, reaching far, far away where the people of God uh, just seemed to go on forever. You've heard of too big to fail. The structure was too big to function. It was a ridiculous space. <laughs> now, this meant, as uh, those of us who were in the bleachers, as we looked uh, much more prominent than the front, which you needed binoculars to find, uh, were the long lines that marked the margins. I was in the bleachers. Who else was in the bleachers with me? Johnny were there and many others. Many others were there. Uh, we were a church, as we looked from those bleachers, to my eyes, that were defined by straight lines that marked who's inside and who's outside. Now, we were off in the bleachers. At that moment, I was an activist, not a bureaucrat. And we were looking to interrupt and to make a witness. We didn't have access to the stage or to the microphones, but through our friend Marla Markham from the Better Future Project, we had the people's mic. Some of you know this from the Occupy movement. It's a call and response method uh, where you uh, 
take over with your voices. Here's what I'm getting at. When we spoke from the sidelines in the bleachers, outside the lines, in that huge space, when we spoke, the room changed its shape. Because all of the delegates on that huge floor were called to bring their focus to a new point in the room. And the faces just turned. When our focus changes, we change. And once we spoke from the sidelines, we saw a transformation. What once were profiles suddenly became people. And I'm reminded what the bishop said about the chance that the cabinet created for people to sit down and have conversations, to look at each other. And in the bleachers, outside the dividing wall, we realized that we had much more access to each other than we had led ourselves to believe. We learned, I learned, we can do this. We just have to act like those obstacles do not exist. They do not deserve our obedience and our respect anymore. We can speak up and we can overcome some things. That time, and in this one situation, which is you know, particular, we ain't get in any trouble at all. In fact, they all, once we finished, they said, okay, right back to business. But once they did go back to business, I do remember, in my memory anyways, some of the delegates finding within themselves permission to walk off the floor and come join us up in the bleachers. They were attracted by the joy of telling the truth from where you stand. There's nothing like it in the world. When we speak a truthful word that is relevant to the moment, we give permission for people to be free. We reach people who the power structure simply cannot reach. And even if they could reach, they wouldn't know how to communicate with them to begin with. So don't worry about that, because they're so hindered by their own sense of structure. I think that it was that experience that gave us the creativity and the courage to twice later in general conference just walk on the floor and go to the communion table. And also in our witness at the edges, we helped many people, including bishops and voting delegates, find a new place to stand at the edges where they could disregard what had once held them back. Okay, now we'll have a little bit of fun with this if you all don't get too excited. <laughs> with some quick examples from, uh, from the Bible and from Methodist history and from life in ministry. First, I just want to say, Remember my problem about wrestling with structure and having uh, the opportunity to be in service. And apply uh, what the bishop said in the altar for all call to obedience statement. Unjust structures no longer hold our respect. And we can just focus on the normal course of pastoral ministry. Then we can be obedient. I just have one issue with that phrase, Bishop in the, the phrase, the normal course of pastoral ministry. And that is the use of the word normal. There is no such thing as a normal course of pastoral ministry. <laughs> when we behave as if the all too real restrictions, obstacles, and divisions that are built up by sin are not worth comparing to the power of God who is really in control. We may not be normal, but we are faithful. And when we are obedient to the God who really rules the world around us, we bring a new focus and are no longer just so many profiles out there in the chaos. I'm glad you're about to stand, okay? But we ourselves are transformed into being full persons God calls us to be. Let me to quickly summarize here. I just want to go through some of these. You're going to like this. The Hebrew midwives in Egypt, do you remember them? When they realized that it was up to them to defy death, to love life, and to break the law, they were being obedient to the God who really rules this world. Whenever people who are thirsty and have no money but come to the waters anyway and drink, they are defying the restrictive laws that serve no purpose other than oppressing outsiders. You see where I'm going with this? When Mary, when her soul magnified the Lord, she herself was demonstrating that the unjust and pointless limitations that others had built up just to keep her down were not going to prohibit her any longer. When Peter fell into a trance 
just long enough to start to hear voices that freed him from being forced to live divided any longer. He was remembering where his loyalty really lies. We're almost there. Don't, don't forget, every Methodist knows this story. When a neurotic, emotionally tortured young man can let go of his own issues and psychological self-defense mechanisms long enough to feel that his heart is strangely warmed, mm -hmm. then he is behaving as if the old internal obstacles don't have power over him anymore. Hold this example very tenderly, friends. When a stranger in your community, a newcomer from somewhere else who doesn't know anyone else, stands up on a Sunday morning in front of a room full of strangers, and despite all the immorality and injustice and restrictions that the world throws at them, when they are asked, perhaps by you, do you confess Jesus Christ as your Savior? Put your whole trust in his grace and promise to serve him as Lord in union with the church, which God has opened to people of all ages, nations, and races. And then they are ridiculous enough to say, I do. <laughs> that they are behaving as if every pointless rule in this world no longer exists. Here's my last example. When two lesbian women are so faithful and so full of love that they want to give each other rings with the words, this ring is a symbol of my love for you and our commitment to be united. Wear this ring and be my love. Don't you want to be the clergy person who says, seal this covenant with a kiss, amen? That's what being obedient to God is all about. None of these examples are ends in themselves, but they all witness to a higher law of love, of love that connect us to God on God's own terms. So I hope that uh, sharing from the heart has allowed you to share a little bit of the joy uh, that I know uh, through Bishop Talbert's witness. Thanks.